Hello, hello, and welcome back to another episode of General Conference Conversations, the podcast where we have conversations about General Conference. I'm your host, Kaylin, and today, well, as at the time that you will be listening to this, we have under a week until General Conference. So that's crazy. <laughs> um, um, this will be posted most likely the Monday before conference. Uh, this time I'm cutting it quite close. Um, the closest we have <laughs> ever, I have ever cut it. Usually I'm a couple weeks, two to three weeks before conference that I have our last week, our last, my last episode. But this time it did not work out that way, obviously, but that's okay. We are going to make it. We are going to make it through these last three talks this week. So up first is Love is Spoken Here by Elder Gong. And of course, I definitely encourage you to go and listen to or watch or read this talk before you come and listen to me talk about it so you can get your own insights and everything. Um, especially to remind yourself going into this next conference, what he said last time. So, of course, this talk is all about love, and he starts out with a sweet little story about him and his wife, and then he talks about how we speak in many languages, and not just in, like, actual verbal languages, but also through art and music and dance and symbols and expressions of body language, right? Intonation. And so um, he, as a kind of analogy metaphor, he talks about the three languages of gospel love. And they are the language of warmth and reverence, the language of service and sacrifice, and the language of covenant belonging. And so he starts out by talking about the language of warmth and reverence. And he says that when he and his, his wife are traveling for you know church service, she asks, how do you know your parents and families love you? And he gives a bunch of different examples. And I really loved this. Um, have, he gave a couple examples where he says, you know, my mom is super tired all day. And even though she's tired, she still comes out and plays with me. Or you know, even time, even though we sometimes disagree, I trust my mom. And that those mothers, when they heard their child say that, cried. And he says this very, very simple little thing. He says, sometimes we need to know love is spoken. He- Sorry, hold on. Sometimes we need to know love spoken here is heard and appreciated here. And so I really love that. Very simple, right? Like, um, it's hard, like we all love in different ways, right? We also feel loved in very different ways. And it's so much easier for the people around us when we say, you know, I like that. I like when you do that. Or, you know, I felt really cared for when you made me that thing or when you asked if I was okay or if you asked if I got home okay, you know, right? And sometimes it's awkward to do that, right? Sometimes it's like, uh, or for something you, somebody you don't know very well, but they did something that like really made your day. It can be awkward, but it's also so nice to hear, right? Like, hey, you're doing a great job and I see that. I see you and I see the effort that you're putting in and I see the love that you put into the world. That is so, so critical for people. Um, and just makes you feel loved, right? Like even if, even if that's not usually how you feel love, like maybe it's awkward for you too. If somebody's like, you're amazing. And you're like, oh, thanks. Like compliments are hard or, you know, it's, it's not how you kind of feel it, but it can still be really great to, to hear that and to, to know that your efforts are seen and appreciated. Um, he also talks about warmth and reverence in our church services and how um, 
talks about how new members and non-members um, so the church vocabulary is, is often requires decoding, is what he says, and, and obviously we, we know this, right? He gives a couple of examples of like steakhouse and ward building and opening exercises that in other contexts, that's not what that means, right? Um, I give this example all the time, but for a while, right before my mission, I was the YSA steak rep. And so, first, I had to explain what YSA was, right? I had to be like the young single adults. We kind of do activities together. In some places, there's whole wards or branches or stakes that are all made up of just YSA, right? 18 to 30 year olds who are not married. But then you have to go on and explain what's a ward, what's a branch, what's a stake especially steak, like this, I'm the YSA steak rep. So, you know, we have our congregations, which then a bunch of them make up a steak, like one big, it kind of grows out, right? Like you have to give to kind of um, explain the whole organization of the church. And then as a representative, you know, what do I do? <clears throat> what is a rep, what does a YSA steak rep do? And, and that's just like, one phrase, right? And if I were to go up to, uh, maybe not everybody in the church would know what a YSA stake rep is, but like you could probably figure it out, right? Oh, you're a YSA, you're over the whole stake, you're representing the YSA for the stake. Like, oh, cool. But for someone who doesn't know what YSA is short for or what stake means, it can take a little bit of decoding um, or a little bit of translating to, you know, like using the word congregation instead of ward or um, like trying to uh, equate like our clergy, quote unquote, right? With like our bishop and stuff like that. Anyway, this was, I remember hearing this in this talk and I remember being, I loved this so much. Um, <clears throat> he basically says, you know, let us be understanding and kind as we learn these new languages of love together, you know, for new members, for members, or for non-members, like, right, like, where sometimes we're speaking different languages and meaning the same thing. And he talks about this one new member, and he says, new at church, a convert was told her skirts were too short. Instead of taking offense, she replied, in effect, my heart is converted, please be patient as my skirts catch up. And I really loved that, right? Like, she, that can be really horrible, especially as, like, as a new member, you're told all these things that you can't do. You're, you're starting a new lifestyle, right? You're giving up a lot of old things. You're trying to pick up new things and learn all of these things. And it can be really overwhelming when someone's like, you're doing it wrong, right? Um, and I liked her response, a little bit sassy, a little bit, you know, whatever, right? But like, the point is, I'm converted. I'm, you know, like, let me catch up to everything else. <laughs> so, and it talks about the power of language and along, going along with that. And I, and I think I, language is very powerful. This is something that I'm very passionate about. I'm a writer, I have an English degree. Words and stories are how we create our perception of the world, right? And like, for example, when I was in college, I worked at our writing center. And first of all, it was very distinct from the other tutoring services that were offered by the college. Um, they didn't want to call it tutoring because it wasn't tutoring, it was the writing center. So you'd come in with for help with your writing. It wasn't a proofreading service either. You didn't come and drop off your paper and have us proofread it and then take it, pick it up in a couple of days. You'd come in and sit down with a peer consultant. That was our, that was our, our title was peer writing consultant 
we weren't called tutors, we weren't called editors, we weren't called proofreaders. And I remember our like our my boss being really, really stickler for that and being like, We are you're not a tutor. You're not here to fix their paper, you're here to consult and you are their peer. You're not better than they are, you're not you know, you don't have a a, a master's degree and ten years experience, right? You're just you're you're also trying your best and you just happen to you know, like writing more or be a little bit better at writing or, you know, understand it a bit bit more. And even just that, I don't know if, I don't know if students have noticed, but I definitely noticed it changed the way I thought about my job, right? I wasn't there to be a tutor. I wasn't there to, like, I've never said that I was a tutor. I was a consultant. I was a writing consultant. It sounds kind of pretentious to say I'm a consultant, but also like, it's different, it's different than being a tutor. And um, the words that we use and also the way that we talk about something, the tone that we talk about it with, the words that we talk about it with can really convey meaning that maybe we don't intend. Um, I think of all of the like, the things that I learned as a primary kid that I really wonder now, you know, one, was I not understanding the concept because I was a child? And two, like, did my primary teacher intend for me to have that meaning associated with, like, repentance, right? Or was it just that was the way they talked about it, but they really, like, but but it just didn't come across the way they, they wanted it to come across, right? Um... And so giving each other grace, but also trying to be careful with our own words and, you know, try to convey our meaning as best we can. Being bold and blunt and upfront um, while also being kind, right? But like straightforward and can be, can, and it obviously all depends on the, the situation, of course, but, but just being aware of our language and being aware of like, what are we saying? What are we in? What are we implying when we say something? When we use a certain word, that kind of a thing, right? So, the second gospel language of love is service and sacrifice. And he talks a lot about callings a lot. And he also talks about, like, um, ward service activities and stuff like that um and he talks about going to england on on assignment and he they're going they're going to these wards and they went to a couple of like gatherings like ward gatherings parties get together or whatever and he says for some time, I have felt that in many places in the church, a few more ward activities, of course planned and implemented with gospel purpose, could knit us together with even greater belonging and unity. And I agree, right? Like, ward gatherings are great. Um, I also want to remind people <laughs> of the work and time that it takes to prepare those events and then even for people the sacrifice that it takes for people to attend those events people are very busy and i know that that's not like a well you need to be less busy so you can go to church kind of a thing but like we we can prioritize things differently right but there are going to be times when like you can't change that your baseball game is the same night as the word party or whatever it may be, right? Um, and some people have different priorities rather than just ward events um, or going to ward events first, you know, right? That's, sometimes that doesn't take priority for people. 
and also I think the pressure that it puts on especially specific organizations it's honestly often the same you know three or four or five families that are we call them I'm trying to think of what we call them my mom as a missionary it was like the the same 10 families did everything they hold all the same callings hold all of the big callings how hold um plan all of the events go to everything you can you know, count on them being there kind of a thing and it can get really exhausting no matter how willing and excited they are to plan another ward party it takes time and takes notice it takes money it takes t- um effort and it takes sacrifice and i obviously this is what this whole point is about is about you know sacrifice and service but to really understand that right and to to know that if someone says no to helping plan something or no to attending something they probably have a good reason it's not just because they're lazy and don't want to go it's probably because you know they're tired (laughs) right like they don't have the time they don't have the energy they are two weeks behind on their laundry or whatever right like there's going to be a reason for that um so I just wanted to point that out. Also, if he says this a little bit later as well, that gospel activities also invite neighbors and friends. And when I was on my mission, and I don't remember if this was a ch- like a church-wide thing or if it was just our stake that did it. And it was really cool. They, I think it was the stake, the stake presidency was like, we're encouraging all of the wards to have their ward events in their neighborhoods and this was right after covid this was like during covid right um and so they were really trying to figure out ways that they could be outside um which is really important so they wouldn't have to all be at the church building right and I remember one of the bishops, he was like, we really are trying to have our activities, that was part of the word at mission plan, was to have activities in their neighborhoods. And so it wasn't like, here, come all the way to the church building, or like, show up at a religious institution that you do not attend, and decorate cookies with us, right? Instead, let's all meet up at the park down the street, and decorate cookies. Or let's all meet up at my house, and decorate cookies, right? And sometimes that takes a little bit of different, that's a different way of thinking about things, right? It's not like, oh yeah, we'll just do it in the cultural hall. But it's like, hey, can we use your house? Or is the park available? Or, you know, stuff like that. But they were so successful and it was so great to like bring these communities together. Um, One that we did, which is still my favorite, and it was so amazing. My last few weeks in this one ward, they called all female ward mission ward missionaries, which was absolutely brilliant because we were sisters. And so one, they could come to lessons with us, easy peasy. It was great. They could be like a th- like the three. Sometimes we had to have a third sister if we were going to meet um, like a single male. Um, but also, they just all worked really well together. It was fantastic, and they just thought of these amazing things. And one of the sisters, so one of the things they like organized was a, uh, what did they call it? Uh, like a, a water ride. Um, man, I can't remember what they, what, like what, the, it had a catchy title, it had a catchy name. But what they did is she went around her neighborhood, uh, posted like, put flyers on doors and like knock, knock, talk to people and was like, hey, on Saturday, we're all going to meet over on the the road right outside my house and we're gonna have our water going our our hoses going i think they got like a like a fancy like water play thing and like our kids we're inviting everybody to do a ride we're going to do laps around the neighborhood and if you could come out and have your hose on and spray the kids as they're driving past they're riding their bikes past that'd be great and so we got to go and we got to like direct traffic so the kids didn't go out to the main road and, and stuff like that 
and it was so much fun they had a really great turnout and of course like i said it was during covid or was starting to lighten up a little bit but still like people were just starting to come out of their houses and so it was amazing because nobody was like forced proximity nobody was uncomfortable nobody had to wear masks we were all outside and the kids had a blast the, the parents had a blast like i remember a couple of the neighbors they were like who organized this this was amazing we should do this again and of course they were there and so they had that that association also with oh yeah this really amazing woman did this um but also like she had help from the church and like there's there's part of it right even though it wasn't like hey let's go down to the church building where we're gonna have a prayer and a spiritual thought and then decorate cookies i don't know why i keep going back to decorating cookies but but it still had that like bring everybody together um have interactions with people you might not have ever had interactions with and also like show people that the mormons are nice or whatever right um so i really liked those and then of course the last of the gospel languages of covenant belonging and a lot of this is about um kind of coming together right of kind of ties the first two together is we're not just alone we're 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 around people we're supposed to be around people of course that looks different for everybody but like our our covenants that we make with god and christ and we also make covenants to to lift others and to have them in our lives basically and at the very end he talks about ai and <laughs> it wasn't his point was he wasn't like pointedly talking about ai but he mentions ai and how it's kind of come a long way in the way of um translating languages um at first they would only translate something very literally right or in a very specific way when there are a lot of nuance and a lot of different meanings to words and he he says this interestingly repeating extensive examples of a language teaches a computer a language more effectively than does teaching a computer the rules of grammar <laughs> Similarly, our own direct, repeated experiences may be our best spiritual way to learn the gospel languages of warmth and reverence, service and sacrifice, and covenant belonging. And so I really like that analogy, right, of like, um, and we know this, right, like you can learn, even for people, you can learn the rules of grammar of a language and not know how to speak the language. There's a lot of like high schoolers who or people who took four years of a language but can't speak it. Um, they might know what the words mean individually or know how to conjugate a verb, but they wouldn't be able to pull the language out of the back of their heads and say, you know, communicate with someone. Whereas someone who goes in and is immersed in the language for a year or two, um, I mean, we see this as missionaries all the time, right? But like, when you're immersed in the language and you have examples of it and you're using it constantly, then like you're actually practicing and putting it into practice and you're getting examples of it, right? You're, and you're, somebody says something like, oh, what does that mean? And they're like, oh, well, it kind of means this, but it also has kind of this sort of meaning. And as you hear people use it in those two different contexts, you learn to differentiate it, right? Even with our language, like our first spoken language, our native language, right? As we learn up and as we grow up and learn, you know, as a teenager or like a, a preteen, we somebody will say something and be like, "What does that mean?" And they're like, "Oh, well, it kind of means this, but also has this kind of secondary meaning to it." Um, and as you use your language and as you absorb the the words that people are saying around you, then it's much more. I mean, you also then learn the actual roots of grammar in school, right? But, like, as a two-year-old, your parents aren't sitting you down and say, okay, and then this word in past tense is you add the ED. Like, they don't do that, right? 
um, they're learning by experience and by example. And so he uses, of course, that as a way to analogize our learning the gospel languages, learning how to love others and how others love us. Um, it's repeated experiences. It's over and over and over again. And so to go along with that, he asks two questions. And I was like, this is perfect. These are these are the questions that, that I want to ask people that, well, that I'm going to ask people because um, Elder Gong said it so beautifully. He says, so where and how does Jesus Christ speak to you in love? <clears throat> where and how do you hear his spoken love here? His, wow. Where and how do you hear his love spoken here? And so a couple of different ways of asking the same, kind of the same thing, right? It's like, how, how does Christ speak to you in love? And how do you see his love in the world, in the other, in the people around you? Um, it's really quite amazing to, to feel the love of God through other people. Um, so yeah, so ponder on those questions. Where and how does Jesus Christ speak to you in love? And where and how do you hear his love spoken here? And of course, as always, check out his footnotes. He's got not a lot, but he has some um, scriptures and stuff and uh, and things like that. So definitely check those out. But that is all I've got for you today. Thank you so much for listening or watching. Um, as always, I'm on Instagram and Facebook um, and YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, uh, General Conference Conversations, and I always love to hear from you. So messages, emails, comments, reviews, send them my way. I will talk to you all next time. <laughs>